Good evening and welcome to This is Revolution. My name is Jean Bajelon, in for Jason Miles, speaking to you from the past. So uh, before we begin today's show, I have to do the usual announcements. Please, if you enjoyed the pro uh, content we produce, remember to like and subscribe, hit the bell, go on to Apple, re uh, Apple Podcast Reviews and give us a review if you so choose. And if you have the money to support the show, please consider supporting This Is Revolution on Patreon. I would like to remind you all, no white people are paid in the production of This Is Revolution. So, you know, Consider it your reparations. Now, today we have a very special guest and an exciting topic to uh, talk about. But before we introduce the topic and the guest, I am joined here by my wingman, my sidekick, or maybe I'm his sidekick, the one, the only, C. Derek Vaughn. Which is it? I think of us as Startsky and Hutch, so I don't know who's whose sidekick. And... Uh... Um, if you are, if I am your sidekick, I will probably shiv you. So, oh, that's that's, that, that's pretty scary. Um, hmm. there are no sidekicks under socialism, everybody's yes. a sidekick. That's what it's all about making the common every, ruin of humanity, the common ruin of humanity. That's what we're fighting for today. Well, today we have a special guest, we have Sora Bamari. Uh, who is the uh, founding editor of Compact Magazine. He's been uh, around, uh, he's a, a journalist, he's worked for various outlets over the years, but you know now he has his own uh, outlet. And he has also uh, written a book called Tyranny Inc., which I actually think is a really fantastic name. And I want to suggest to him that if his book is translated into Turkish, he should consider taking my Twitter handle, which is uh, uh, istibat ve teraki, which is like tyranny and progress. That's the that uh, that that would be a good uh, name for this book as well, which I thought, uh, which I found extremely interesting. Now, Sorab is, we should say, on the conservative uh, uh, end of the spectrum. Although after reading his book, I am I'm beginning to I'm beginning to question how much of a conservative he actually is, but. Rather than just talking about him, let's bring him on the screen. Welcome to This Is Revolution, Saurabh. Oh, your sound is uh, your sound is gone. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for agreeing to come on. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's let's jump right into it. So you have this new book, uh, uh, Tyranny Inc. That's coming out. Uh, well, when this interview is going to be broadcast, it will be out. It's coming out on the fifteenth uh, of August. And it is, well, when I read the book, I was thinking, this is definitely not the typical conservative arguments uh, that we hear regarding the problems affecting uh, uh, America. And, you know, a lot of the things that I've read on the right, and I'm not, I'm, you know, I don't read everything on, on, you know, on the right. There are friends like uh, Matt McManus and, and, and Ben Burgess who engage uh, more with that stuff. But from what I've read, obviously, uh, a lot of the critiques uh, about the current state of affairs in the United States and in the world in general uh, are rooted in cultural critiques. Um, but in Tyranny, Inc., you are putting forward a, what I would call a materialist orientated critique. Can you can you uh, uh, give us a little bit of an idea about you know what inspired you to write this uh, uh, critique and particularly this critique of private tyranny, which I think you know when we think of tyranny, we're often thinking of the government doing things, but you're making this critique, which we usually see on the left, about the unchecked power of private corporations and the way that they kind of uh, the way that capital is lording it over labor. So can, can you give us a little bit of a genealogy of this book and why you decided to write this from a conservative perspective? Yeah, sure. Uh, again, thanks for having me. This book was um, conceived on election night 2020 uh, when the outcome of the election was still unclear, but already the kind of early vote, what it was revealing was the fact that the GOP had consolidated the gains that it had made four years earlier in 2016 with working class people. Uh, already in 2016, um, Trump 
won the highest share for a GOP uh, nominee of union households uh, since Ronald Reagan in 1984. Uh, so this was actually pretty crucial to him winning in places like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, these very kind of crucial battleground states where uh, the margins were very thin. In part, marginally, it was uh, union households that went for him. It was typically framed as a phenomenon of the white working class. What the 2020 election revealed, the early uh, uh, kind of results that night, was that he had expanded his support in in kind of pretty striking ways among working class people or lower middle class people of color as well. So that very night, um, this kind of buzzword took hold that the GOP is now the party of the quote multiracial working class, which that phrase has now become kind of common parlance on the on the right. Um, and so I was pretty excited about that. I was then the op-ed editor of the New York Post, mm -hmm. which is the more populist of the kind of Murdoch papers in the United States. It's not, um, it, it had been pretty pro-Trump. So in a way I was editing the paper that Trump read most religiously, especially the op-ed pages. And, you know, what I put in front of Trump kind of put, made the news or made his agenda or made his Twitter feed. Um, so, and I had become one of these conservatives who wanted to see a more populist um, kind of pro-worker Republican party. And so when the 2020 results came in, the early results, before we even knew that he had lost, it was this kind of galvanizing moment that yes, you know, like it, this ratified what had gone on the previous four years. And, um, you know, the, the, the time is posed for, a, the time has come for a complete realignment of the two parties, Democrats being the party generally speaking of, uh, you know, of, of Wall Street, most of Wall Street, of Hollywood, of Silicon Valley, of the professional classes, and generally people who manipulate information on screens for a living as compared with, you know, kind of tangible workers, which a Bloomberg poll showed were the kind of coarse donors to the to to the uh, Trump campaign in 2020. So that was the kind of prelude, the excitement. But then, you know, I set about writing this book that would be a manifesto for this kind of conservatism. That was what, what I pitched to Random House, and they took me up on it. But then I sort of began reporting on the shape of our political economy. Um, and the more reporting I did, the more it became clear to me that much of the kind of ballyhooed um, pro-worker conservatism was largely a mirage. It was often, um, like you said, it was uh, it, it's channeling uh, legitimate grievances of working and lower middle class people in this country uh, against against capital, against large corporations, et cetera, but channeling them largely into cultural grooves, right? So it's like, the corporation is pushing trans ideology. The corporation is trying to undermine your, you know, your faith in our history or in the American project with sort of critical race stuff. Um, and that many of, you know, and that it wasn't addressing what seemed to me doing, I mean, I was already aware of this to some extent before, but the more reporting I did for the book of the problem of coercion in the private economy, that is the, the fact that asset less Americans broadly speaking, uh, face pervasive coercion in our lives as workers and consumers. Um, and it's a kind of coercion that is unchecked precisely because we, ca we say it's private. Um, and therefore, this private zone um, is not subject to the same democratic give and take or the same sense of fair play, et cetera, that we associate with our quote unquote public lives. And this problem especially is a problem, is a conceptual problem on the right, which is there is this keen awareness of tyranny um, and even of, of, uh, of, of private actors benefiting from private privilege. This is a kind of pervasive Jacksonian theme going back to the mid 19th century. But the tyranny of just the private itself is something that uh, the right isn't used to talking about. So instead of writing a manifesto, I ended up writing what is largely a reported book where I give a picture of our political economy from the bottom up, from how ordinary people experience it all too often. So for example, and I'll be pretty brief here, but um, you know, workers who want to blow the whistle about wrongdoing, but they're gagged by non-disclosure mm -hmm. and non-disparage agreements. And the whole way that uh, employment agreements are structured 
based in sort of neoclassical or libertarian, you know, classically liberal economic theory that they meet employers and employee meet as equals and they both negotiate over the terms of the agreement and walk away. You know, each can walk away. So they have symmetrical power, which is just not the case, has not been the case, you know, at least since the middle 19th century, right, since the Industrial Revolution, when there are very few employers and many, many more employees. Or the abuse of commercial arbitration in the workplace. Commercial arbitration is this practice that is pretty old, the idea that, mm -hmm. you know, merchants or other disputants of relatively equal bargaining power would resolve their disputes privately rather than going to the courts and being able to bind each other not to go to the courts. But now that's been expanded to the workplace. Mm -hmm. um, so that if you have a um, Fair Labor Standards Act dispute with your employer, you're, bit, you're being underpaid illegally, you still have to go through arbitration in through these privatized courts where you're much less likely to prevail. And even if you do prevail, your um, payout will be much smaller. Or the erosion of the real economy by private equity and hedge funds, and even the takeover of what you could, normal people would consider public services like, you know, firefighting and ambulances and so forth are now taken over by private equity and hedge funds in ways that, first of all, take jobs away from public servants in those areas. Um, second of all, they reduce the quality of these services often dramatically. And third, the most outrageous thing that I found, which is kind of, I, it's a scoop, it's reporting that I I'm presenting for the first time is the fact that in many cases, the pension funds of these public employees of, uh, you know, uh, firefighters and emergency services workers, their own pensions invest in private, equ private equity firms who are in the business of privatizing their jobs and so on and so forth. So um, that's the book. Now, just one last word about how conservative this is. I think relative to the conservatism that emerged um, in the middle 1970s with you know Buckley and and Goldwater and then especially with the Reagan administration this is definitely is going to be called you know Sorab has gone back to his marxist roots because i used to be famously a trot etc um but but really i mean if you go back to a, a slightly one generation earlier kind of conservatism uh you know you you, you encounter a conservatism that was more at peace, for example, with the New Deal, because these, you know, Eisenhower, Nixon, et cetera, were men who had lived through the New Deal era, and they understood why, um, you know, unrestricted private power was a problem that required collective action, including governmental action and response. Um, and they, they were much more pragmatic and less ideological. So, you know, we can get into like how this might play out in the conservative movement, but I try to sort of frame this as a project of recovery that, um, you know, so social democracy or the idea that the market should be enveloped by more political restrictions to ameliorate this power imbalance is a an idea that used to be legible to people on the right as well. I mean, I'll be honest, like when I picked up the book and started looking in, it was not what I expected uh, mm -hmm. yeah. from from a book. I was certainly expecting, you know, a polemic, but I just wasn't expecting like uh, a detailed deconstruction of the, the, the you know, issues of corporate power in, in, uh, in the United States. So it really, it, it uh, challenged my expectations. And, you know, when I was preparing for the show, I'd been, you know, looking at some of the reviews as well. I mean, your book was uh, compared favorably with that of Patrick Dean's Regime Change, which is coming out at the same time as well, precisely because, you know, it's offering this kind of uh, 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 material uh, critique. So sort of, I guess what I want to say, uh, ask next then is, you know, you offer this powerful critique of like private ty tyranny. You give a lot of different examples. You know, the introduction's a little bit of a bait and switch as well. You kind of like, uh, I won't ruin it for people, but you you kind of play the kind of bait and switch game uh, to to make people, uh, which made me, which made me, which was what the first thing I was like, okay, that's quite a good setup for the book. Well done, bravo, you got me. Um, but. Why does this matter to conservatives, right? Uh, you know, you, you, you're open about your Catholic faith. Um, you know, you're, you're a religious person. Um, 
why do you think this is important for conservatives to, to, to conservatives to take on board? Why must they uh, uh, take this material critique seriously rather than just dismissing it as like Marxist claptrap, jealousy, this kind of things? Right. Really, really, really uh, good question. We'll see if they take it seriously. I, like I said, it's this will be. You know, my books are always reviewed like in in the major places like the Times and Washington Post and stuff. And I think this will be the first time where um, very likely left of center outlets will have started to write pretty uh, favorably about it. Um, and so far as there's only one right of center outlet, it's, it was it was it, it wasn't a well argued review and it was negative. But there will be more forceful kind of free market types who will come out against the book. So we'll see about its reception. But to answer your question, why does this matter? Well, the, the reason this matters is the fact that this matters uh, is or should matter to, to people who call themselves conservative or traditionalists um, is one of my major frustrations. It's why I'm much more uh, populist and even, you know, in terms of my political economic analysis, overtly materialist than any, many of my peers on the right is because I'm, I've been part of the conservative movement for more than a decade. I started my career on the Wall Street Journal editorial page, which is like the bastion of, uh, actually it should be called neoliberalism, right? It's, it's the voice of, uh, you know, low taxes, uh, un, un, unhindered free trade, et cetera. And many of my fellow conservatives constantly lament various cultural phenomena that they're right to lament, right? Um, and we could get into that, but I think, you know, there are objective criteria of human flourishing, and this is what conservatives are, can be right about. Like, we, we are political animals, we are social animals, we like to live in community, we need, we have this element of need, needing belonging and, and, um, and faith, etc. And all of these indicators are on the decline or have been for a while especially drastically under the neoliberal era, right? So uh, beginning, you could, whatever you want to date it, late 60s, mid 70s, early 70s. But since then, you know, conservatives point out uh, marriage rates declining, uh, church attendance rates collapsing, collapsing particularly among working and lower middle class people, right? Not, for the most part, interestingly enough, the American upper class still gets married, stays married, they, are churched relatively, at least where, at least a decade ago when Charles Murray did his study of the two Americas coming apart. Um, it's it, a lot of the ramifications of, of kind of cultural and social decline, the opioid crisis, et cetera, et cetera, correlate to, you know, victims of neoliberal economics, right? In fact, there was a study done, which you can find on, on, on the National Institutes of Health, the way in which the geography of the opioid crisis overlaps with U.S. counties that were most exposed to China trade, right? So, and, and, and it's very, very frustrating for me on the right because my fellow conservatives or uh, what have you will lament these cultural phenomena and they're right to lament it, right? Um, but they never then say, well, what, what possible material economic roots could these phenomena have? Now, I, I'm not a crude materialist. Culture has its own logic and and not everything is reducible to economics but clearly if you are unable to kind of pay the bills with like one working class job or two working class jobs at most and you have you're finding yourself working with uh, in this kind of precarious condition with no sense of security if as the federal reserve finds um nearly half of americans would struggle to come up with 400 dollars in cash to pay for an exigency that is Nearly half of our fellow Americans, one in two, if they were had to, if they had to pay a four hundred dollar bill, they'd have to turn to credit cards or sh uh, you know like short term loan sharks, etc. Obviously, that's going to ramify in how whether you're able to stay, spend time with your kids, whether you're able to form families, whether you want to even have take the risk of starting a family and getting married, and um, the response of the conservative movement, which I think is more cynical than naive at this point is like if only we just shouted louder about how marriage is a good or how you know you you should do this you should you should spend time with your kids and seek work life balance etc if we just said that more people would 
would live a different way. And so, and they don't. And the reason that that kind of project of conservative culturalism, as I call it in the book, has failed is because it's divorced from, from material reality. So it is very important. Um, I would say there is much in the sort of, if we step back from like GOP conservatism of recent vintage and turn to, for example, Aristotle or St. Thomas Aquinas, you know, these kind of uh, voices that the, that the right should take seriously, you will find much that says, yeah, you know, people are formed by law and law included in the kind of classical and Christian conception included political economy. And so uh, if you if you want people to be able to even contemplate the higher things, which is Aristotle's definition of happiness and virtue, they need to have a measure of material security to be able to do that. If you have like lots of people who, who are constantly living precariously, they can't reach for a more virtuous life. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think this is uh, something that I think some people on the left have been screaming about for a long time uh, as well. You know, we have this, uh, you know, con we have a country, for example, where the Republican Party and the Democratic Party to to a certain degree, you know, claim that they're working in favor of families. But this is a deeply antenatal country. Even in conservative Britain, they give you 15 hours of uh, free child care, whereas in America, you know. Your salary gets dumped on it. It's just impossible for uh, uh, people to live a traditional life, even if they want to. Uh, you know, it's hard. You, even if you're middle class, if you want to maintain a middle class, you know, lifestyle, you both have to work. And if you both, both parents have to work, that means, you know, less time with the children, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I think these are all very important uh, uh, critiques, which is it, it's interesting to see them come out. Uh, because, you know, like like you said, often the social problems in the country are framed in an entirely culturalist way rather than thinking like, hey, we took all the jobs away from people in West Virginia. Then we also relaxed the opioid prescription regime. And then I uh, wonder what happens when all these people end up like out of work and with cheap opium going around. What could be the result of this? You know, like perhaps it's not just that they're morally decadent, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I, I, don't men I don't mention this in the book, but it's well known because ProPublica reported on it. But, you know, the American Enterprise Institute, which is the voice of corporate America, it is like it's it's the think tank of of corporate interest. Uh, you know, one of their fellows was um, uh, interacting with Purdue Pharma, uh, sending her op-eds, which were always in praise of Purdue Pharma, to the CEO before they were published and kind of getting attaboys from them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, meanwhile, AEI had, had received hundreds of thousands of dollars from, from Purdue Pharma. So, I mean, in some cases, as I said, it's not naivete. It's, it's much more blatantly cynical. So, um, as my last question before I hand over to Vaughn, what I want to ask is, you know, the general conservative line is obviously that, you know, the government is the primary source of, of uh, tyranny. How do you how do you see the role of the government in, in, in general? Do you see the government as an answer to this private tyranny? You know, what kind of balance do you want to see between the 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 uh, the state and private enterprises in civil society. You know, what's the balance you're looking for? I mean, obviously you're not in favor of, you know, like workers control, you know, the dictatorship of the proletariat, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, what kind of balance would you like uh, to see? Would you like to see something like a Sanders, uh, you know, a Sanders program uh, being implemented? Yeah. I mean, is that what, that's what it seems from the story you said at the beginning about how this was originally going to be a manifesto and it turned into a critique, it seems that you're disappointed with the outcome of Trump, that, that Trump was this op, uh, opportunity that you saw to have a more uh, pro-worker conservatism. But at, as you said, it seems that you just have like, I don't know, the, 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 the things have fallen from your eyes and you're like, this is uh, cynic. They're being cynical. They haven't implemented this program. So, what what do you sure. want to see? Okay. Well, first, one sort of theoretical point, which um, you know will resonate with both of you. If you 
takes seriously an economic, a left economic histor historian like um, Karl Polanyi, right? Mm -hmm. um, and of course, much in the Marxist tradition that says, that, yeah, I mean, the this, this state is often, you know, the apparatus of market society, right? In other words, the reason that we have a market society in the first place was the result of enormous state coercion. Uh, the Hamiltonian state displaced the more subsistent uh, subsistence, uh, subsist, uh, please cut that if possible, a subsistence oriented kind of patriarchal economy. Um, and it cor cor corralled many sort of uh, former kind of patriarchs and, and, and peasants into uh, kind of proletarianized labor markets and so on and so forth. You know, in our constitution, they barred the ability of the states to modify contracts in favor of debtors. Um, the whole Hamiltonian apparatus of import substitution, uh, internal improvements, including taxes, which were very unpopular among common people to fund those internal in improvements, all aimed at creating a national market. All of this was kind of state coercion. So um, the first thing to say is that one way or another, um, the state is involved in political economy. And so the illusion that there is this, and this is a right-wing illusion that there is this pristine area called the economy, um, and then this other area called the state that occasionally intrudes or obtrudes upon um, the economy is, is that, is just that, it's, a, it's an illusion. Um, so to put all this more concretely, you know, I'm in favor of, of politics compassing the market. I'm in favor of um, politics being used to bring about um, something like a class compromise model like that which pre prevailed um, in, in the mid-century on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, what that particularly means in the year 2023 is different than what it meant in 1945 to 1973. Um, but the sort of broad principle that the state has to play an active role especially in the in the labor market to help raise up the countervailing power of uh, working class people. But also in, the, the state can also help lift up the countervailing power of consumers as well through like energy cooperatives, et cetera. These were all achievements of the New Deal, um, you know, whose specifics might now change because of macroeconomic developments. But the fundamental idea, I think, is trans historical and would apply as much now as it as they did back then. Um, so I think, you know, I, there's a lot in the Sanders program that I would sign up for Medicare for all. Um, I, you know, I didn't write about it in the book, but this kind of pervasive insecurity that you have in the United States, where if you get sick, you, know, you could go bankrupt or live for a lifetime under. Even if, even if you don't get sick, if you have a baby, my wife was back at work two weeks after having a baby. Right. That's criminal. That is, uh, yeah, there's that's pure criminal. barbarism. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I would support that um, uh, industrial policy. And that's just just the assertion that the government and people democratically have a say in 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 which industries we emphasize and which ones, um, you know, we restrict or we we de-emphasize and, and how what we export, the, the what we import to what degree, all of this has been relegated by the neoliberal model to like market rationality, which just means the say-so of, of, a, of a narrow kind of economic elite. So I would definitely sign up for that. Um, I think, by the way, that the Biden administration has done a relatively decent job at, at the level of like its National Labor Relations Board, which typically Democrats are better. But I think they've gone a little bit further in recognizing that the country has a uh, severe deunionization problem. And so, you know, you want higher union union density. Um, you know, we we can restore that. Possibly, it might mean doing away with the Wagner Act because shop by shop organizing is actually exhausting for employers and employees alike. Um, a lot of our employers are kind of national scale; they're oligopolies. And so, if we just have sectoral bargaining or regional bargaining where you don't have to like fight to get a union individually. If you get a job in XYZ industry, you're automatically represented. You might choose to get more involved, but generally speaking, you know, once a year management 
and and uh, labor and the government sit down in this tripartite structure and decide about wages and working conditions, et cetera, et cetera. These are not like crazy ideas. These are things that they were like achievements of the New Deal. A lot of the even pre pre New Deal, like Hoover. Uh, had a lot of these ideas with association associationalism. A lot of progressives think like they think Hoover and they, they kind of confuse him with Calvin Coolidge, who was a kind of free dogmatic free marketeer. Hoover was much more complicated and he ha a lot of his ideas ended up getting fulfilled in the New Deal. Yeah. Anyway, that's all I'm saying is, 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 is restoring what I call political exchange capitalism, which just means that the market is subject to, to greater political control. And so that, or, working people don't experience the market as this thing that is imposed on them from above and coerces them relentlessly, but have a say, they can push back, they can countervail the power of the large with equally large counterpower. Sounds like you need to set up a DSA Catholic yeah. caucus, yeah. maybe. There are, there are such things. Yeah, I I'm think. sure that, I, I think, I don't know if they have a Catholic caucus, but it sounds... Uh, yeah, it's it like a faith caucus or something. Faith caucus, yeah, exactly. Cornell West would be in it. So I'm going to hand over the questions to Vaughn to talk about some of the big picture questions beyond, uh, you know, beyond your book, uh, Tyranny Inc., which I, I really do recommend people uh, pick up a copy. Like I said, when this is uh, interview is broadcast, it will be available at all good uh, book places. And there's a link in the description for those who are interested. Always important to engage with lots of different ideas. So, Vaughn, please take over the driving seat. Yeah, I get to be the negative part of this dialectic. Um, it, I, I want to say that I actually quite enjoyed your book. And, in fact, it reminded me of some of my own thinking uh, 15, 16 years ago when I was coming out of the what was a nascent paleoconservative movement um, in response to George Bush. Um, and... One thing that struck me, though, and I, I want I want your thoughts on it, because you do cite Lash in this book, um, mm -hmm. is Lash pointed out that the there's a tendency amongst conservatives to speak to the problems of working class people in ways that the liberal left uh, don't. However, to never actually answer those concerns honestly, and that's not new. That I mean, he he particularly saw this post Nixon and in, in Reaganism and kind of the the codification and and concretation of neoliberalism, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I suppose that leads me to the question. Um, while I agree with you, there is a conservatism that is more social compact based. Um, it is not, with the exception of the 20 years after World War II, um, mm -hmm. it has not been the dominant American tradition, say, ever. Um, how, uh, how likely do you think it is for conservatives who you rightly, I think, accuse of being somewhat cynical on these terms, particularly the ones more tied to what we might call libertarianism, um, even though they would probably not call themselves that today. Mm -hmm. um, how, how do you, what coalition could you build to fight them? No, I, 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 I get your question. Um, I get your question completely. Um, I am very, very... Um, in a dark place when it comes to like the hope of um, changing the GOP as a whole, because I've, I've experienced it. Right. I mean, I, I, I know it from the inside and I think uh, you, you're right that basically save for what I uh, borrowing from my friend, Michael Lynn called a sort of Nixon Eisenhower tradition for the most part, the American conservative tradition, if you think about it as, the Federalists, the Whigs, and then the modern Republican Party after Lincoln, um, including Lincoln himself, has always been the party of kind of the self-made man, the you know, uh, entrepreneur, um, and and always thought of the worker as an afterthought, except occasionally in these, um, in these uh, uh, kind of uh, cultural odes that it sings to the worker as such, but without ever without rarely deliver, delivering much concretely. So I think I think your your point is well taken on that. And I see that play out where 
Um, just to give another example, um, you know, the right has now marshaled so much energy over um, corporate wokeness or cor corporations, cultural stances that it's beginning to actually have some marginal effect. You know, like co some co companies are backing down, they're getting rid of their chief diversity officers, as the Wall Street Journal recently reported. Uh, you know, especially if they're consumer facing companies, they're dialing down the like the uh, whatever uh, gender stuff. Uh, or, or trying to, to, to pander. So clearly the, comp the, the right can muster cultural energy. Um, but the one thing they won't address is if you, if you address the fundamental power imbalance in the workplace, you reduce the likelihood of the employer shoving his ideology down the, down the throat of the consumer and the worker, regardless of what that ideology might be. They won't, they won't go there, right? So it, the, the fight against woke capital is only, is largely largely or they complain so much about uh big tech domination uh the fact that um you know a few oligarchs can basically unperson you whether it's elon musk which with his increasingly kind of creepy direction that his ideology goes or it's you know zuckerberg either way you you know uh public discourse is at the mercy of oligarchs but then when it comes to like actual reforms you're more likely to get stuff out of someone like lena khan who's president biden's um competitions are than you are out of any of the sort of uh even the populist republican types who complain about big tech on on fox news but don't ever actually deliver policy wise so where can you find the coalition i think there are a few exceptions and they're because they're look when you have a lot of a lot of downscale voters turning to the GOP, that at some point might have some effect if they if they have enough just sheer desire for political survival that they, for their own perfectly cynical reasons, might begin to shift. But that requires, um, that requires those working people to actually make demands of the GOP if they're going to vote for GOP. And how do you do that? Well, I don't know, but that's, that's partly a work of um, conditioning um, uh, unions and the GOP to interface together more. Believe it or not, it is kind of happening a little bit uh, precisely because, look, unions can see that a lot of their rank and file, especially in certain type of tangible industries, uh, you know, carpenters, roofers, electricians, et cetera, in, in, in railroads, et cetera, are, are politically can be drawn to the, to the GOPs. They have to figure out, okay, how do we how do we work with with unions and reduce the mutual hostility between the two? Um, that involves obviously the, the GOP not being so um, sort of prima facie against unions. Um, it also does kind of mean though, that I, and I think I've 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 long advocated for this. Like the, if 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 the labor movement were more just about labor instead of like if you know as as uh, if you like go to the page of any like a national unions, it's not the same at the local level, but the national unions. Um, so much of it would be like, you know, maximal reproductive rights are what labor is what labor is all about. And you're like, well, but like a lot of your length and fine members don't believe that. And you're going to, you know, if there's coalition building to be done, uh, it would be stifled by that. But I still think most of the initiative has to be taken by Republicans and Republicans responding to the fact that they have these voters and they'll lose them. And I think they will lose them already in 2024 for not having delivered for them. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, the, I, I, that part of the analysis is actually interesting. While I agree with you that all evidence is that if you were going to take the average, I will say non-urban um, uh, person, working class person, anyone who, who earns between, say, fifty and $250,000 a year. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a pretty broad range. That includes a lot of upper middle class people as well. That yeah. is your Republican demographic. Um, interestingly, the Democratic demographic is weirder. Um, it is people who make generally less than eighty thousand dollars a year are more than two hundred fifty thousand. Mm -hmm. um, so there's this flip, um, and but the the biggest trend amongst working class people uh, is not voting, <laughs> like. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um at all mm -hmm. and so uh, i suppose my, my 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 question is if there is a say a slight majority of the multiracial working class who are willing to 
sign up to a conservative program. And and if we get really specific on the demographics, I was looking at pupil for this and it kind of backs up your analysis with the exception of uh, it does seem like inroads into the black community are pretty thin mm -hmm. um, inroads into Latin community have been very successful inroads into the Asian community kind of really depends on income. Mm -hmm. um, the indigenous community, little known fact, and unless you're fairly well off tends to vote Republican and has for like 50 years. Uh, the, the exception is the DNA nation, um, which you would not get from indigenous discourse. Interestingly, um, yeah. I, I think that, you know, I guess my, my question there is like, well, they've been doing fine, at least, uh, to some degree being able to, to maintain significant 50, 50 balance in the general public without actually appealing to the working class beyond a very superficial culturalist mode. Uh, do you think that's going to change for the GOP? Well, I mean, my mind immediately goes to the, it goes to the upcoming election and specifically the GOP primaries. Um, they, if they want to be able in 2024 to win, you can't have someone like DeSantis, right? Who says, who all he has is like woke culture, anti-woke culturalism. And clearly, um, you know, base voters, which include uh, working class people, lower middle class people can see through mm -hmm. that um, because, you know, DeSantis is like a benefit slasher, an entitlement, quote unquote, reformer. He's even early on, you know, in his congressional career, career talked about privatizing entitlements. I always use the phrase earned benefits and not entitlements because um, specifically FDR set them up so that it would be out of workers own payroll taxes. So it had the quality of mutual aid. And so you couldn't say, well, we're giving you welfare and therefore we're taking it away from you. No, it's you put in, you put your money into that. It's workers' mutual aid. Uh, but regardless, he's targeted earned benefits. And um, that all of that is, is, is to me, suggests disaster. And the fact is that he's not doing so well in the, in the polls, at least for now. Who knows? I've, I've predicted so many uh, elections incorrectly and had to eat crow afterward that I'm very sort of circumspect about making prognostications about what happens at the ballot box. But regardless, it's telling that the one candidate who still has the heart of the of the GOP base is the one who is critical of foreign interventionism, is the one in, in complicated ways, who is, um, you know, calling for peace in 24 hours in Ukraine, who attacked DeSantis in these brutal ads. It was a, a political action committee that ran them. But attack DeSantis in early states as someone who wants to take away your social security. Um, it's, it's Trump. And so, and, and with DeSantis, I would add this, you know, a lot of conservatives may agree with some of the social issue stuff. Like they might be anti-trans, they might be anti-CRT, you know, they might have what me and Van regard as, you know, quite socially reactionary positions, but DeSantis is kind of off-putting because it's mean-spirited. And even if, you know, even if they're against these kind of things, they're like, no, this is just, you know, they just don't like the mean-spirited uh, uh, nature yeah. of these things. It's too, it's too grotesque. It's like, whoa, what are you doing? Like, you know, we're against the, you know, the gender-affirming care for children because we care about the children, not because we hate trans people as it yeah. were. But like there's such a, a vicious and mean streak to the culture of war, which plays very well for a certain... Uh, uh, plays well online. With plays like, well online. With Whereas Trump, people are missing it. Like the culture war stuff with Trump was like the icing on the cake. It was the, the, the reason people liked him was because he was like talking about like these kind of Free trade and social free security and stuff. stuff like that. Yeah, just, just very quickly, I want to I want to actually underscore Varn, uh, sorry Derek's point though that um, that he's right and in in interesting ways the one of the biggest obstacles to the GOP becoming a work a genuinely working class party even as it continues to attract um, low income voters increasingly one of the biggest obstacles is that the power base of the party is neither 
quite just the sort of um, sociopathic billionaires, although they do wield influence, um, nor is it the working class people that are attracted to it. The power base of the GOP is is the, is regional capital. It's the guy who owns like a, a tire distribution chain in pool the cleaning company. Capital. Pool cleaning yeah, company. Yeah, yeah. Ble it, blessed, blessed are uh, the yes. It, this is what I always tell people. I live in Springfield, and if you want to know who the Republican base are, it is the Chamber of Commerce, the Chamber of Commerce, and conservative professional managerial class types. Right, and also people, you know, the people who go to the rubber chicken dinners, toasting mm. the self-made man, etc. And that is, in some ways, from for for what I aspire to. I know that's not. For you guys, the sort of political telos is not class compromise, right? You, you, you want, but for me, if I if I think I want something like social democracy and and merely class compromise is good enough, and perhaps the best we can achieve, you can actually, in some ways, it is easier to get that in the clash between large corporations and large labor unions. That's the kind of model of the New Deal is like a few oligopolies, and then on the other side, the countervailing power of of uh, of labor with government acting as a kind of mediator. Um, it's much harder to make that pitch and to sell that to regional capital because, and it's, it's typically someone who is, it's, it is the Jacksonian type. It's like, I'm mad that like large corporations are doing well. I am much more, uh, vulnerable to the vicissitudes of the market. I feel kind of screwed. And like the worker, is my enemy the government is my enemy the large company is my enemy and there's, there's a much more siege mentality um and i don't know i, I don't have a point to, i i can't put a good note on this i'm just agreeing with derek that that for structural reasons maybe this shift won't ever happen but you could get you could get um some pieces of good legislation where uh you know individual members of the right because of who their voters are you know, work together with, I don't know, Liz Warren or Bernie Sanders to get, you know, concrete things done. Um, so so yeah. you're not you're not so much hoping for, you know, like you you don't hope. Well, maybe you hope for, of course, but you you would like to envision a situation like even if you can't change the whole Republican Party, you'll have a political situation similar to that of the early 20th century, where you would have Republican and Democratic progressives. There wouldn't be so much of an ideological difference between the two parties, which would create an opportunity for better pro-worker legislation coming out of both parties. Would you say that's a more realistic hope? Yeah, no, that's right. That's right. And, but, you know, look, gradually, uh, Gradually, that combination of pressure, mainly, you know, much of it probably driven by progressives in, in Congress, like like Sanders, like uh, um, uh, uh, Liz Warren and, and others, and then occasionally with the uh, with the sort of sort of pro worker right here and there pitching in, you could see, and then like the Biden administration being the, the way it is, you could see something like a post neoliberal consensus. Uh, emerge and it, it does have to be sort of a consensus of the middle and so that here's another thing that makes it a bedeviling problem is um you know neoliberalism the new deal was a consensus of the mid middle neoliberalism was a consensus of the middle what i mean by that is it became the ideology not just of republicans but also of democrats or you know thatcher famously saying her greatest achievement was tony blair and so if something is to transcend neoliberalism and some other model take root um, it has to also be a consensus of the middle. And um, that's a challenge because of the reasons I spelled out in this podcast. Of all the reasons the G Republican Party is structurally um, hard to move on these issues. I, I am. This will be my last question. And I'll tell you the question that you're skipping out on because I was going to ask you about uh, Protestantism versus Catholicism on these issues. Um, because the one thing I will have pointed out to people is... Uh, Paleo conservatives are rarely Protestants. Sometimes they are, but uh, they generally the Orthodox Christians, uh, Catholic Christians are a uh, minority, but even some of them are Jews. Uh, but uh, you're you're gonna dodge that bullet, luckily, so that you don't have to start a, a new thirty years war. Yeah. Um, the 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 bullet I'm gonna lodge at you though 
is um and my last question is militarism in, in all of this, because one of the things I think that that has been under discussed and it doesn't come up in your book um, is the shift to finally neoliberalizing the military, which ironically happens after classical neoliberalism is over. So um, the, and that's really about the, the shift of policy from from kind of military Keynesianism, which I don't think people realize really held a lot of red states up and really did have a poverty draft, which doesn't really exist anymore because of drones. Um, and in that complete streamlining, uh, privatizing of a lot of the military. Um, I, I find it difficult to imagine uh, pivoting um, America conservatives uh not uh, against imperialism, because I think actually, interestingly, right now, there is an anti-imperial streak coming out of the right that we haven't seen be dominant in like, I don't know, 50, 60 years um, since since uh, part of the Nixon coalition. Let's just put it that way, um, that that's not my, my my concern. I can't see them fighting the defense contractors in a real way. Um and given that part of the the conditioning of the late 20th century, in particular the last 20 years of the 20th century, was that the military was this bulwark for parts of the working class and its communities. And I think people miss that part of it um, that was holding up a lot of these economies that got, you know, yes, they got hit by by the flood of cheap goods from China, but they also got hit by the lack of investment from military contractors. And yet... There's more money than ever going into military contractors, but now it's not really being spread around. How do you get conservatives or liberals? Because I, I found I, uh, our left liberals or even the left to really talk about that. I found that almost impossible to do. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I so here's here's what I you know, advocate for, and then we, we, you can see how distance, distant it is or not from reality is that, um, you know, the one achievement of Trumpism um, was the recognition that free trade is not this sort of natural, um, inevitable outcome of world history, but rather is a policy choice and therefore can be reversed in various ways. And so the, the, a Biden administration has taken that on, uh, you know, most notably, not just in obviously not scrapping any of the uh, the China tariffs that Trump imposed, uh, but even in especially the speech that uh, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan gave, in which he denounced more or less the Washington consensus as having been a failure at home and abroad, and kind of articulating that they, the administration is thinking about beyond neoliberalism, and so. Um, ideally, that could be an opening to um, an opening to a kind of more uh, regional uh, supply chains, reshoring manufacturing. The Biden administration is doing some of that now. The three of us might think that it's, he's not spending enough, uh, you know, etc. But they are they are doing that, and um, so what does that mean? Is uh, potentially you can have a lot more manufacturing at home, including defense manufacturing. The worry that I have, and maybe this addresses your concern, is that instead of saying, "Hey, we're going to reshore manufacturing, we're going to be doing all this because the working class has been battered in this country, and we want to sort of reconsolidate at home," much of it is driven by kind of, you know, um, uh, a desire to have one last hurrah of a century of the American century, which doesn't tolerate, you know, other powers, uh, even asserting themselves in their own near peripheries and sort of confronts at every stage, you know, the slightest thing from China. So that, that's, that's um, so, so what I'm trying to tell you is I think you could have a kind of buildup, including military industrial buildup, uh, of a kind we haven't seen in this country since the days you mentioned when when uh, you had military Keynesianism. However, the danger of it is that it's, uh, well, it's military Keynesianism and it has a kind of outward aggressive uh, uh, 
uh, sword pointed at the world and ultimately at ourselves therefore it's the gunboats of neoconservatism right like that's that was the 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 quiet part that was i guess made loud by the bush administration but nonetheless yeah. So, so you have you're concerned that you know, like we might get an industrial policy, but you're concerned that it might be sold to the public as a military necessity rather than something to, to benefit. Uh, to benefit. Yeah, yeah, uh, and also, I mean, or or, um, you know, that it that even the possibility of having letting this industrial policy play out and reconsolidation at home and sort of building back up at home will be wasted on a war mm -hmm. uh, we already had wasted 20 years on these kind of pointless uh 9-11 wars which i as a sort of younger conservative you know uh cheered but to be fair i was in my like mid-20s um there were much older men who actually made the big decisions <laughs> but but um you know we we you know we all learned that they, they were a disaster so like the pivot to immediately now sort of confronting not just one nuclear power but two um nuclear powers uh and waging wars for democracy again etc cetera, etc cetera, is a little bit uh scary and it, it risks wasting i think you know another 20 years uh, yeah maybe the u.s can fight for taiwan i don't know i think i think it'd be a, a utter catastrophe but at any rate what it will mean is that the kind of reconsolidation that this moment promises won't play out and that's the really scary part where um you know uh, on the right, there is some skepticism of foreign interventionism, but too often it's like, no, 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 you, you can't, you see, we can't fight Russia because we have to go to war with China. With China. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's the problem with a lot of, uh, and I've said this before, and I think other people have obviously said it before, often the debate around anti-imperialism is it's actually just a tactical debate over where the uh, empire's resources should be deployed rather than saying like you know maybe maybe we should be you know considering winding the whole thing down and uh and i think that leads to confusion so at this present moment the republicans are against the democratic party war in the ukraine but that's because it's the democratic party war not because it's a war per se agreed yeah but uh well we're running up against the hour um so you know, I want to thank you, Sora, for your time and just reiterate, you know, the, there is a link to the book Tyranny Inc. in the description. Uh, you can get your copy. I believe it's on Audible as well. Do you have anything else uh, to plug before we go? No, just, no. Uh, you know, hope people like the book. I mean, I think um, even if you the, the kind of larger arguments about, yeah, politics should compass the market and not the other way around are familiar to you, I think you'll be struck by the some, some of the reporting especially you know the financial reporting in terms of how um companies are so hollowing themselves out at the at the altar of or, or kind of stabbing themselves on the altar of private equity and hedge funds and especially the public services are divesting you know their own workers jobs using their own the workers own capital in the form of their pension contributions that's genuinely new and i think it'll open some eyes, even if you disagree with um, my larger class compromise frame, mid-century frame. But uh, I definitely hope we can have you on again to talk about some of the other things that uh, you guys are doing over at Compact, which I, 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 I read and I find has things that make me angry and things <laughs> that I agree with. But, you know, that's... Uh, that's what we set out to do. So thank you. Um, Vaughn, anything else before we head out? Uh, this has been a, a lovely conversation, and I, I, I do think um, I would tell my leftist audience, uh, you do need to talk to people who don't share your political values <laughs> more often. <laughs> um, and so, you know, one of the things that I have encouraged is, is talking to people on this uh, conservative anti-imperialist. I've talked to Scott Horton, who's, you know, his, his uh, economic politics, I think, are insane but uh we stand on similar grounds in regards to anti-imperialism and and talking to you who while you're right we don't share atelios um i i tend to take class compromise i let me put it this way i would love for it to be possible um and that's, that's one of our big differences but uh 
but I think it's important that we do that in these in these things. And that's a, one of the things um, that I think kind of needs to happen in this current moment because everybody seems to be hitting a wall. And when you do that, the status quo just plods on. So, Agreed. Thank you both. Thank you. And as we say on This Is Revolution, we are out. <laughs>